Hibernation 65. Grizzly's Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation. Read by David Grizzly Smith. Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, by Edwin Abbott Abbott, read by David Grizzly Smith. Part 1. This World Section 7 of Irregular Figures Throughout the previous pages I have been assuming what perhaps should have been laid down at the beginning as a distinct and fundamental proposition that every human being in Flatland is a regular figure, that is to say, of regular construction. By this I mean that a woman must not only be a line— but a straight line, that an artisan or soldier must have two of his sides equal, that tradesmen must have three sides equal, lawyers, of which class I am a humble member, four sides equal, and generally that in every polygon all the sides must be equal. The size of the sides would, of course, depend upon the age of the individual— a female at birth would be about an inch long, while a tall adult woman might extend a foot. As to the males of every class, it may be roughly said that the length of an adult's sides, when added together, is three feet or a little more. But the size of our sides is not under consideration. I am speaking of the equality of sides, and it does not need much reflection to see that the whole of the social life in Flatland rests upon the fundamental fact that nature wills all figures to have their sides equal. If our sides were unequal, our angles would be unequal. Instead of its being sufficient to feel or estimate by sight a single angle in order to determine the form of an individual, it would be necessary to ascertain each angle by the experiment of feeling. But life would be too short for such a tedious groping. The whole science and art of sight recognition would at once perish— Feeling, so far as it is an art, would not long survive. Intercourse would become perilous or impossible. There would be an end to all confidence, all forethought. No one would be safe in making the most simple social arrangements. In a word, civilization would relapse into barbarism. Am I going too fast to carry my readers with me to these obvious conclusions? Surely a moment's reflection— and a single instance from common life must convince everyone that our whole social system is based upon regularity, or equality of angles. You meet, for example, two or three tradesmen in the street, whom you recognize at once to be tradesmen, by a glance at their angles, and rapidly bedimmed sides, and you ask them to step into your house to lunch. This you do, at present, with perfect confidence, because everyone knows to an inch or two the area occupied by an adult triangle. But imagine that your tradesman drags behind his regular and respectable vertex a parallelogram of twelve or thirteen inches in diagonal. What are you to do with such a monster sticking fast in your house door? but I am insulting the intelligence of my readers by accumulating details which must be patent to everyone who enjoys the advantages of a residence in Spaceland. 
Obviously, the measurements of a single angle would no longer be sufficient under such portentous circumstances. One's whole life would be taken up in feeling and surveying the perimeter of one's acquaintances. Well, already the difficulties of avoiding a collision in a crowd are enough to tax the sagacity of even a well-educated square. But if no one could calculate the regularity of a single figure in the company, all would be chaos and confusion, and the slightest panic would cause serious injuries, or, if there happened to be any women or soldiers present, perhaps considerable loss of life. Expediency, therefore, concurs with nature in stamping the seal of its approval upon the regularity of conformation. Nor has the law been backward in seconding their efforts. Irregularity of figure means with us the same as, or more than, a combination of moral obliquity and criminality with you, and is treated accordingly. There are not wanting, it is true, some promulgators of paradox who maintain there is no necessary connection between geometrical and moral irregularity. The irregular, they say, is from his birth scouted by his own parents, derided by his brothers and sisters, neglected by the domestics, scorned and suspected by society, and excluded from all posts of responsibility, trusts, and useful activity. His every movement is jealously watched by the police till he comes of age and presents himself for inspection. Then he is either destroyed, if he is found to exceed the fixed margin of deviation, or else immured in a government office as a clerk of the seventh class, prevented from marriage, forced to drudge at an uninteresting occupation for a miserable stipend, obliged to live and board at the office, and to take even his vacation under close supervision. What wonder that human nature, even in the best and purest, is embittered and perverted by such surroundings! All this very plausible reasoning does not convince me as it has not convinced the wisest of our statesmen, that our ancestors erred in laying it down as an axiom of policy that the toleration of irregularity is incompatible with the safety of the state. Doubtless the life of an irregular is hard, but the interests of the greater number require that it shall be hard. If a man with a triangular front and a polygonal back were allowed to exist and propagate a still more irregular posterity, what would become of the arts of life? Are the houses and doors and churches in Flatland to be altered in order to accommodate such monsters? Are our ticket collectors to be required to measure every man's perimeter before they allow him to enter a theater or take his place in a lecture room? Is an irregular to be exempted from the militia? And if not, how is he to be prevented from carrying desolation into the ranks of his comrades? Again, what irresistible temptations to fraudulent impostures must needs beset such a creature? How easy for him to enter a shop with his polygonal front foremost, and to order goods to any extent from a confiding tradesman? Let the advocates of a falsely called philanthropy plead as they may for the abrogation of the irregular penal laws. I, for my part, have never known an irregular who is not also what nature evidently intended him to be, a hypocrite, a misanthropist, and up to the limits of his power perpetrator of all manner of mischief. Not that I should be disposed to recommend, at present, the extreme measures adopted in some states, where an infant whose angle deviates by half a degree from the correct angularity is summarily destroyed at birth. Some of our highest and ablest men, men of real genius, have, during their earliest days, labored under deviations as great as, or even greater than, forty-five minutes and the loss of their precious lives would have been an irreparable injury to the state. The art of healing also has achieved some of its most glorious triumphs in the compressions, extensions, trepannings, colligations, and other surgical or dietetic operations by which irregularity has been partly or wholly cured. 
advocating therefore a via media, I would lay down no fixed or absolute line of demarcation, but at the period when the frame is just beginning to set, and when the medical board has reported that recovery is improbable, I would suggest that the irregular offspring be painlessly and mercifully consumed. Section 8. Of the Ancient Practice of Painting If my readers have followed me with any attention up to this point, they will not be surprised to hear that life is somewhat dull in Flatland. I do not, of course, mean that there are not battles, conspiracies, tumults, factions, and all those other phenomena which are supposed to make history interesting— nor would I deny that the strange mixture of the problems of life and the problems of mathematics, continually inducing conjecture and giving the opportunity of immediate verification, imparts to our existence a zest which you in Spaceland can hardly comprehend. I speak now from the aesthetic and artistic point of view when I say that life with us is dull, aesthetically and artistically, very dull indeed. How can it be otherwise, when all one's prospect, all one's landscapes, historical pieces, portraits, flowers, still life, are nothing but a single line, with no varieties except for degrees of brightness and obscurity? It was not always thus. A color if tradition speaks the truth, once for the space of a half a dozen centuries or more threw a transient charm upon the lives of our ancestors in the remotest ages. Some private individual, a pentagon whose name is variously reported, having casually discovered the constituents of the simpler colors and a rudimentary method of painting, is said to have begun by decorating first his house, then his slaves, then his father, his sons and grandsons, and lastly himself. The convenience, as well as the beauty, of the results commended themselves to all. Wherever Chromatistes, for by that name the most trustworthy authorities concur in calling him, turned his variegated frame, there he at once excited attention and attracted respect. No one now needed to feel him. No one mistook his front for his back. All his movements were readily ascertained by his neighbors without the slightest strain on their powers of calculation. No one jostled him or failed to make way for him. His voice was saved the labor of that exhausting utterance by which we colorless squares and pentagons are often forced to proclaim our individuality when we move amid a crowd of ignorant isosceles. Well, the fashion spread like wildfire. Before a week was over, every square and triangle in the district had copied the example of Chromatistes, and only a few of the more conservative pentagons still held out. A month or two found even the dodecagons infected with the innovation. A year had not elapsed before the habit had spread to all but the very highest of the nobility. But needless to say, the custom soon made its way from the district of Comatistes to surrounding regions, and within two generations no one in all Flatland was colorless, except the women and the priests. Here nature herself appeared to erect a barrier, and to plead against extending the innovation to those two classes. Many-sidedness was almost essential as a pretext for the innovators— Distinction of sides is intended by nature to imply distinction of colors. Such was the sophism which in those days flew from mouth to mouth, converting whole towns at a time to the new culture. But manifestly to our priests and women this adage did not apply. The latter had only one side, and therefore, plurally and pedantically speaking, no sides. 
The former, if at least they would assert their claim to be really and truly circles and not mere high-class polygons with an infinitely large number of infinitesimally small sides, were in the habit of boasting what women confessed and deplored, that they also had no sides, being blessed with the perimeter of one line, or, in other words, a circumference. Hence it came to pass that these two classes could see no force in the so-called axiom about distinction of sides, implying distinction of color, and when all others had succumbed to the fascinations of corporal decoration, the priests and the women alone still remained pure from the pollution of paint. Immoral, licentious, anarchical, unscientific, call them by what names you will. Yet, from an aesthetic point of view, those ancient days of the color revolt were the glorious childhood of art in Flatland, a childhood, alas, that never ripened into manhood, nor ever reached the blossom of youth. To live was then in itself a delight, because living implied seeing. Even at a small party, the company was a pleasure to behold. The richly varied hues of the assembly in a church or a theater are said to have more than once proved too distracting for our greatest teachers and actors. But most ravishing of all is said to have been the unspeakable magnificence of a military review. The sight of a line of battle of twenty thousand isosceles suddenly facing about and exchanging the somber black of their bases for the orange and purple of the two sides, including their acute angle, the militia of equilateral triangles, tricolored in red, white, and blue, the mauve, ultramarine, gamboge, and burnt umber of the square artillerymen rapidly rotating near their vermilion guns, the dashing and flashing of the five-colored and six-colored pentagons and hexagons careering across the field in their offices of surgeons, geometricians, and aides-de-camp, all these may well have been sufficient to render credible the famous story how an illustrious circle, overcome by the artistic beauty of the forces under his command, threw aside his marshal's baton and his royal crown, exclaiming that he henceforth exchanged them for the artist's pencil. How great and glorious the sensuous development of these days must have been is in part indicated by the very language and vocabulary of the period. The commonest utterances of the commonest citizens in the time of the color revolt seem to have been suffused with a richer tinge of word or thought, and to that era we are even now indebted for our finest poetry and for whatever rhythm still remains in the more scientific utterance of these modern days. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzliesgrowls.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.